So I present to you, Mr. Andre Dyer. On behalf of the President of the United States, the United States Navy, and a grateful nation, please accept this flag in honor of your loved one's service to our country. In addition, please accept these three shells in remembrance of the three volleys fired here today to honor our fallen comrades. Let's all come close now. Mr. Andre's grandson has reflections and remembrances he'd like to share with us all. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, that's tough to follow. Um, uh, today I have the honor of reintroducing you to William Costa Andre, better known to me as Grandpa. For those who don't know me, my name is Andrew Hill. I'm the youngest of Paul's child, uh, children, the youngest grandchild, and even though this is widely debated, the favorite grandchild. <laughs> if you need proof, just look at his phone. My name is first on the list. <laughs> Granted, my name does begin with an A, but I'm almost positive it has nothing to do with it. I kid, though. Let's all celebrate the life of a wonderful man, or how some put it, a life well lived. William was born September 2nd, 1924, son of Antonio C. and Marie de, de, uh, Trinidad Andre, brother of Olinda Greer, Antonio C. Andre Jr., and Manuel C. Andre. Husband to Paula S. Embrix, father of three children, seven grandchildren, and 14 great-grandchildren, and friend to all as we met him. We are here today to remember the life and legacy he leaves on earth. It was a long, simple life, never complex, Always with good, honest intentions, I would like to reflect on the person my grandfather was. I could stand here for the better part of the day and reminisce about all the stories Grandpa was either part of or he told. And for all those who knew Grandpa, you understand how he heard them told over and over, but always with the same genuineness. No matter how many times I heard them, I always enjoyed listening to them. We will cover some of those, but overall, I would like to remember the person Grandpa was and what he has done for everyone he met. Grandpa was above all else a family man, followed very closely by a compassionate social servant, always showing the community the same caring that he would for his family. First serving in country, or first serving his country in World War II in the U.S. Navy as a landing craft driver, that uh, he fought for Normandy invasion, bringing British troops to the battle. That was followed by a long 31 year career with East Providence Police Force. Even though with all those years under his belt on the force, he never once sought out promotions. With the love of being around the community, and working with the people, he chose to stay a patrolman his whole entire career. The term family man is not appreciated nearly enough these days. Today, there is more emphasis put on who we are and what we accomplish. Grandpa, though, was the epitome of how great and unselfish it is to put those and your family first. Grandpa never asked for much. He drove plain, simple vehicles, lived in a modest home, which also happened to be his home for 90 years, and never took anything for life for granted. Grandpa and Grandma put everyone in the family first. We always said that. My Grandma was the heart of the family. We realized, though, that when Grandpa was the strength that held it all together. That was very apparent when we lost our grandmother almost nine years ago. Grandpa found his heart when he stumbled across the tiny city of Lene. Village. Lene. Lene. In Belgium during the war. My grandfather William wrote the story out, and we have copies if you would like, or if anyone would like to copy that. But I'll give you the footnote version quick. The war brought him to uh, Belgium. The company was marching down the main street of the town, and he noticed three young ladies watching the soldiers march. Instantly, he thought to himself that he was going to marry that one pretty girl. Of course, not knowing how difficult that would be, and that wasn't including the language barrier, my grandmother Paula didn't know English at the time. In short, after four months of staying in the town and the two courting, he approached his future father-in-law and asked permission to marry his daughter. He said no, but with good reason. So what would happen to you if you were killed in the war, he said. Who would take care of her? Paula's father told him that if he came back after the war and fighting, that he could marry her. 
A year and a half later, after leaving Lene, the Ambrick's family got a knock on that door. It was opened by Paula's aunt, and she yelled out, Paula, William is here. Grandma ran out with her tears in her eyes, hugged him, and gave him a kiss. True to my grandfather's words, he returned to prove his love. That love remained to the day he was able to reunite once again in heaven. After settling down with my grandmother, Grandpa joined the East Province Police Force. <coughs> as mentioned before, he served 31 years as a patrolman. He was very proud of the fact that he, ever, even though he pulled his fire in a couple times, he never had to fire it. Later in life, he was also a bailiff for 10 years, he was the president of the EPFOP for three years, and the president of the Police and Fire Retirees Association. I know I was proud to tell people that he was a police officer, but I remember my mother would tell me stories of how it would rain and he would go out of the way in his patrol car to pick her up and how special that would make her feel. I can only imagine. He had many other stories as a police officer, some sad, some happy, and some that I'm sure he never told us. One story does stand out that validates the man he was. An elderly woman called into the police station complaining about something wrong with her house. Turns out that the radiator broke and Grandpa was the responding officer. Instead of leaving the elderly lady and having someone else deal with it, he called into dispatch and told me he'd be a while. Of course, he fixed the issue. A week, a week later, the captain called upon him in his office. The son of the elderly woman wrote a letter thanking my grandpa and then how amazed he was that grandpa would go above and beyond. My grandfather was a true handyman, often being able to get a book from the library, then using that knowledge to fix or build almost anything around the house. He was the go-to man when it came to fixing in our family. Build a garage, no problem. Fix a car, child's play. Build an engine for a plasma ion rocket, well, maybe that's pushing it. But he did new repairs, remodeling, and even built and restored a boat named Paula. Speaking of that boat, as far back as I can remember, Grandpa had a love of ocean, fishing, and lobstering. I think it's the only hobby that overshadowed him being a handyman. The whole family remembered numerous trips to Sconic Point for fishing trips or an afternoon on the beach waiting for Grandpa to come back with lobsters. And oh my, did he come back home with lobsters. <laughs> We've talked about it to this day. Piles of lobster meats sitting in front of us, de-shelled and ready to eat. Even those tiny little legs that people just t usually toss away. It's amazing to think how much love and patience it takes to catch, cook, and to shell all those lobsters. And then sit back and watch us in a feeding frenzy with melted blood or f butter flying around. <laughs> I'm not even sure we talked during it, just growling if someone tried to take, take a piece of meat that someone else wanted. <laughs> I digress, though. But I brought up the word patience. It is embarrassing to admit, but it took me almost 13 years to bait my own hook when fishing for flounder with my grandfather. Not once, I truly mean it, not once did he ever say, the wor did he ever say a word about it. He never teased me, never, never even commented on it. If I pulled up my line and it was empty, he would smile or chuckle, grab a minnow, and slap it on so I can cast again. It was how he handled most situations with me growing up. See the situation, smile at you, <clears throat> make it all better. He was that kind of man to almost any situation. I'm sure there's many here today that saw that same smile. Boy, come to think of it, did I hear smile a lot growing up. Why, you may ask, I probably didn't see my grandfather's face for the first 20 years of my life due to a big camera or video recorder being in front of it. <laughs> my grandfather was an avid memory keeper. Ever wonder what, on, uh, what being on the sun field felt like? Well, I'm sure it was equivalent to the gigantic light being used to be used filming. <laughs> His daughters recall a tradition at Christmas when he would burst into the rooms first thing in the morning with that light shattering the darkness. I'm sure it was so blind that they didn't know what Santa brought them until after lunchtime. <laughs> if he didn't take all those memories, we wouldn't have the joy we get from reliving those on good times. When he was coming towards the end, he seemed to be worried that they would be lost or forgotten. Yes, the pictures may fade over time, and yes, the videos may get distorted, but we will never, ever forget the memories, and the memories he created won't be wiped from our hearts. So between the a police officer, fishing photographer, and fixing everything in sight, he raised three wonderful daughters. Susan, Mary, Rose, and Paula. Hardly ever raising his voice in anger, instead it was the look that he gave that was enough to make you listen. They would mention throughout the childhood that he was always there to help them in any way he could. 
I've asked Susan and Paul to give me a couple stories that they would like to share. Also, I have a story from Mary Rose that Paula remembers. Susan could remember her father looking out for her. Being the eldest, Grandpa was always protective of her, making sure she was secure and safe. Though giving her space, he would keep a watchful eye on patrol or making sure that she didn't overstep her boundaries, like going down to the golf course when she wasn't supposed to. Paula, as a teenager, had breathing attacks when she slept occasionally. Maybe anxiety or perhaps the underlying condition. Either way, she would wake up gasping for air and coughing. One night, she woke up to a violent one. She got up and was going to run to her parents' room. It so happens that my grandfather heard her and he came running to her. They met in the middle and my grandfather picked her up in his arms and just held her to, a chest, to his chest. Even with coughing and spit flying, he never wavered and held her tight. She calmed down knowing her father was here. Mary Rose was, uh, sorry, Mary Rose when she was about four years old went to Belgium with Grandma, Susan, and Grandpa. They were touring a nearby town close to Grandma's home, hometown, maybe 10 miles away. At the end of the trip, they were getting back on the bus, you know, heading back to town, but the bus couldn't hold any more passengers. So letting Susan and Grandma take the last seats, he opted to walk down the town, or back to the town with Mary Rose. Instead of letting her walk, he carried Mary Rose for five miles until Grandmother's brother was able to come get them. I guarantee, if not for the brother, he would have gone the other five miles. All the, other all the daughters told me it was a fierce desire to help his girls in any way. Could that make him so special? Grandpa was a comforter, a protector, and someone that, when you were knocked down, he would pick up and carry the burden. Now, I literally can go on for hours telling stories about my grandfather, how he ran his church at the bingo, or church's bingo hall, or how he held family reunions for years over the Cole State Park. Uh, he had dark rooms and down in his basement where he developed his own photos, but we just don't have the time. He was the best man I knew. I know that's a bold statement, but it still holds true to me. And I know it's the same to others in my family. Grandpa was a wonderful son, brother, husband, uncle, grandfather, and great-grandfather. That had a silent strength that made its presence known without saying much. His shape molded and kept family as one through hard times and good ones. He made me aspire to be a great man. And I hope some of those traits he taught me could filter through the generations to come. He will be missed, but I hold comfort that I will see him again. Thank you all for coming to Hunter William Sayandre. Now, <clears throat> sorry, just a quick announcement. Like they said at the church, there will be a breakfast, lunch, and a cellos located on Warren Ave at 12 p.m. Uh, before we go, I just want to let you know something about my grandfather. My grandfather always said that his father had two rules when it came to eating. <laughs> rule one, there was never any talking when not at the table. And rule two, if you took the food, you had to eat everything on the plate. <laughs> Even though he told us this about his father, we never followed suit and enjoyed breaking those rules every Sunday when we meet up. So please, join us in keeping the tradition alive talk lots, and if you want to leave that slice of bacon on your plate, you go ahead and just do that. <laughs>